we can track which each little piece of DNA where that came from. Decoding the Zika virus, the new scientists, San Diego scientists, who are making research more open for all. Sometimes I'd get to the end of the week and I would just go crash in my bed on a Friday afternoon and not wake up till the next morning. Helping teachers keep the dream alive, the challenges in keeping fully funded educators working in San Diego. And running out of cash, a San Diego group helping human trafficking victims, the community stepping up to support them after a KPBS report. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. New details tonight on the Republican push to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. New analysis undermines claims the GOP health bill protects people with pre-existing conditions. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the group would not be able to purchase comprehensive health insurance at affordable rates. The findings are a blow to arguments from House GOP leaders who managed to pass the bill by adding $8 million to bolster protections. But the CB says it's not enough. The bill would leave 23 million more Americans without insurance. They call it a spending plan that puts taxpayers first. The president's budget chief defended his plans to cut social programs today. It's the first time in my memory at least this is a budget that was written from the perspective of the people who actually pay for the government. And we went line by line through what this government does and asked ourselves, can we justify this to the folks who are actually paying for it? Cabinet officials on Capitol Hill today firing back at criticism of the president's budget plan. He sent a $4 trillion spending plan to Congress yesterday. It proposes to eliminate the deficit in a decade while protecting Social Security and Medicare. To achieve balance, the president wants sharp cuts in a variety of programs, from food stamps to disability payments. Regarding the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, look, I mean, I, 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 my mom told, tells me I saw the very first Sesame Street. Okay? I, in fact, I was curious that there's a printer in the back room here with Bert's picture on it. They've, they've evidently named the printers here, Ernie and Bert. Um, it's a for-profit corporation, and it does extraordinarily well. I don't know if Henson Associates is owned by Disney or have a licensing agreement with D Disney. I can assure you Big Bird makes more money than everybody in this room. Um, and if I, when I do go to that family in Grand Rapids and say, look, is this what you want your money to go to? I think they might tell me no, that maybe they can afford to do it without us. Republican leaders offered a lukewarm response to the plan. So we'll be taking into account what the president's recommending, but it will not be determinative in every respect. Some Democratic members called this budget immoral. The Trump budget is shockingly extreme the antithesis of what the American people have said they want from their government. It leaves no question of what this administration values, greater gains for millionaires and corporations at the expense of American families, economic progress, and our national security. Yes, the president's budget is a betrayal, a line-by-line -line tally of broken promises. But above all, it's a shattering of dreams and the loss of hope and opportunity for millions of families. This budget starts by taking away health care, then food, then housing, then education, then job opportunities for nearly every American family struggling to get ahead. There's one area of the president's budget proposal that's getting praise from California Democrats, and that's transportation. The Trump administration has agreed to fully fund a $650 million federal grant to electrify a commuter rail between San Francisco and San Jose, which will eventually be linked to the state's high-speed rail project. California's two Democratic U.S. Senators, Dianne Feinstein and Kamala Harris, are both praising the decision. Small business leaders gathered at the county administration building today to ask supervisors to invest surplus funds in improving the region's social safety programs. Members of Main Street Alliance San Diego say the county has a $1.7 billion reserve. That number comes from Center for Policy Initiatives. One suggestion from the group 
used some of the money to increase financial initiatives to landlords to accept Section 8 housing vouchers. Things like that would help uh, increase the number of available housing and in turn put more money back into the economy as people are spending less money on housing and more money on discretionary uh, items such as at our businesses at Main Street. Main Street Alliance members plan to present their report to the supervisors before budget hearings next month. SDG&E wants to build a new natural gas pipeline almost 50 miles long from Rainbow in San Diego County's North County to Miramar Air Station. Only a few dozen members of the public showed up to the scoping meeting in Escondido today. The project would cost more than $600 million. The California Public Utility Commission sent out almost 50,000 postcards inviting residents and elected officials, officials to three three public meetings on the project. Construction of the new pipeline would affect people living in Escondido and Poway, but some critics question whether a new natural gas pipeline is needed at a time when the region is moving towards more sustain sustainable and cleaner sources of energy. There will be another opportunity to find out more about the plan tomorrow in San Diego at the Alliant University campus starting at 2. Dreams realized. Today, some of the U.S.'s newest citizens were naturalized in San Diego. More than 1,500 people from 88 countries had their citizenship finalized at Golden Hall downtown. Ahead of the ceremony, reporters asked the new citizens about hot topic issues in the immigration debate, illegal immigration, and the president's plans to build a border wall. People, when you come in in America, you should have a lot, uh, you should have a legal paper. But I don't know to the other people, that is their opinion. I think it's absurd. Uh, I don't know why he came up with that idea. Uh, personally, as Brazilian, I love Mexicans. I love to go to Mexico all the time. I work with tons of Mexicans. I think they're great people, and I don't think they do any harm to the United States. I mean, yeah, there is some crimes generated by Mexicans, but there's also crimes generated by Americans. Secretary of State Alex Padilla delivered the keynote speech. He encouraged the new citizens to register to vote. On Monday, we told you about an anti-human trafficking program running out of money. Now the organization has received good news. KPBS City Heights reporter Taryn Minto has an update. The U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants provides funds for nonprofits that serve foreign victims of trafficking, including La Maestra Community Health Centers in San Diego City Heights neighborhood. The national group was facing a budget shortfall that would have halted funding to the program at La Maestra. And all of these are international victims. The move would have left Carmen Comp's clients without support. But if we don't get the money, these 18 cases that are, are open are going to be the street again. But this week, Compt and the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants received some good news. Back in business. That's Lee Williams, the committee's chief financial officer. He says the federal government shifted dollars to fund the program for another 16 months. And there will not be a, a disruption to our ability to provide uh, the needed services. Now Compt can re-enroll some of her clients and add two more who are on a waiting list. Since the initial story ran on KPBS, Comp says she's received even more support. A lawyer has offered Comp's clients her legal services, and a professor offered to give a victim a place to live. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. A Spanish-language discussion about human trafficking is scheduled tonight at Mountain View Breckworth Library in San Diego. The event is part of the city's public awareness campaign called Out of the Shadows. Pink slips currently landing in teachers' mailboxes are one of the reasons the number of teaching credentials awarded by San Diego universities dropped 30 percent over a five-year period. The profession can look pretty unstable for college students taking on debt, and that's a problem because California needs more teachers. KPBS education reporter Megan Burks has been looking at the ways the state can mend teaching's bad rap. Let's start with the big one, 
money. Beginning teachers in San Diego County make between $37,000 and $48,000. That's more than $30,000 below the median income here. Take Elijah Gonzalez of Thrive Charter School in Rolando. He's wrapping up his first year of teaching. I, I love Thrive. I love the environment. I believe in the mission. Um, but if I want to stay in California and continue living in California, um, I also have to look at you know, my budget. Gonzalez is also wrapping up a short-lived house hunt. There's a special program that pays up to $15,000 toward a down payment for teachers, but the Chicago transplant says his student debt and income kept him from qualifying for a loan to buy in the San Diego market. If we wanted like a basic townhouse here, it's, you'll probably spend around $230 to $275. Um, in Chicago, like there's places that are like that expensive and more but there's also more affordable options. Gonzalez has one more year of training before he finishes his credential. After that, he might look into moving back to Chicago. One of my coworkers here, she's also from Chicago, and she got a condo for about 80000 And there's nothing on the market for 80000 here. Like, even trailers are going for, like, 120000 Like, it's, it's expensive. <laughs> Currently, California lawmakers are considering several options to help new teachers. One proposal would help school districts build housing for their teachers. Another would cut teachers' income tax in half and give them tax credits to cover the cost of their credentials. Those benefits would kick in after five years of teaching. But that timeline is a problem, says Thrive Director Nicole Assisi. That can be a long time to wait under crushing bills and a tight rental market. Like a lot of those who spoke with KPBS, Assisi says the real answer is to better fund education. I love what I do, but it sure would be nice if, you know, the salaries that people earn um, mirror the values that, that we have around education. On a recent evening, current and former teachers got together for pizza at the Teach for America office. The nonprofit is working to bring more people into the field. <laughs> Attendees bonded over classroom horror stories and tales of their first year on the job. I remember sometimes I'd get to the end of the week and I would just go crash in my bed on a Friday afternoon and not wake up till the next morning, like 9 or 10 a.m. And I don't think I ever expected that teaching would take that much like emotional and physical energy. David Lopez heads Teach for America San Diego and says fostering a support system for teachers is huge. He says what kept him going was a supportive principal. Who basically said, I believe in you. Um, I think you really care about the work. I see you relating to your students. I love that you share the background of your students and the energy you, do, you bring to the classroom. I believe in you and we're going to be there with you as you figure out some of the more technical details around lesson planning and lesson delivery and assessment. Um, and that meant a ton for me. A sign next to the pizza urges attendees to leave advice for new teachers. A common theme, everything isn't going to be perfect. One of the cards reads, embrace failure. Really hard to get yeah. motivated. Yeah. But the stakes are higher at the state level. California projects it will need 20,000 new teachers next year. Its universities have been graduating about half that. Megan Burks, KPBS News. We asked San Diego educators what made them stay in the classroom. You can find their answers at kpbs.org. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos is a passionate proponent of expanding school choice, including private school vouchers. She has the clear backing of President Trump. But does the research justify her enthusiasm? NPR education correspondent Corey Turner offers a primer on how these vouchers work. School vouchers are a big, controversial idea that President Trump and Education Secretary Betsy DeVos both support. Some 15 states offer them, plus Washington, D.C., which has the only federally funded voucher program in the nation. A traditional voucher program lets parents choose where to spend some or all of the money a state would have spent on their child in a public school. That includes taking the money to a private school or even a private religious school. And that's why critics have argued that vouchers violate the Constitution's Establishment Clause, which says that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. But in 2002, in a 5-4 split, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Ohio's voucher program was constitutional. The court held that the government was not choosing to spend state money in religious schools. Parents were. 
And that made all the difference. Today, the majority of states still do not have voucher programs because their state constitutions have what are known as Blaine Amendments. These specifically prohibit the use of public dollars in private religious schools. Now, Blaine was a Republican lawmaker in the late 1800s who pushed this idea at the federal level. Now, he failed, but many states still went ahead and added the language to their state constitutions. Voucher programs vary a lot from state to state. They're generally limited to low and middle income students or students with disabilities. Ohio, for example, has a voucher dedicated exclusively to students on the autism spectrum. These programs often give students less money than the state would have spent in a public school. This is true in Indiana, which has the largest single statewide program in the country, now serving 34,000 students. Now, supporters of vouchers say they're a kind of social justice, giving low-income students access to schools they couldn't otherwise afford. Meanwhile, voucher critics argue that too often these programs divert public funds to private schools, and that in some programs, private schools are actually allowed to cherry-pick students, turning away low performers and even kids with disabilities. As for the research on vouchers, it's been mixed. There's limited evidence early on that some students benefited from a shift to private schools, but more recent studies of programs in Louisiana, Ohio, Washington, D.C., and Indianapolis have shown voucher students actually losing ground, in some cases significantly. One potential benefit of vouchers shows up in multiple studies. It's a slight improvement in the performance of nearby public school students. Though, of course, that only helps the kids who choose not to use vouchers. Our team at NPR Ed has spent the past few months looking into some of the nation's oldest and or largest voucher programs. Be sure to check out our work at the link somewhere near my head right now. Coming up tonight on PBS NewsHour, how an unsolved murder in the Capitol turned into a baseless conspiracy theory. An analysis tells us how fake news can easily spread in a polarized political environment. Journalistic principles weren't met, right? The story was run without the source being properly vetted and without uh, the D.C. police or the rich family being consulted. We have two grieving parents who would like to find out the truth about their murdered son. And what they're getting instead is an avalanche of conspiracy theories and politically motivated spin. If you are predisposed to think that something sketchy happened with the DNC and the leaks, uh, then you are more likely to believe stories uh, that aren't uh, necessarily true. And as this one, it has been roundly debunked. In California, Senator Dianne Feinstein weighs in on former FBI Director James Comey's role in the Trump-Russia investigation. That's tonight on PBS NewsHour, starting at 7, right here on KPBS. Well, it feels cooler out there, and we're expecting this cooling trend to stick around. Erin Calandra has tonight's forecast. We certainly see a change in our weather. We have some precipitation off the coast, and we're actually going to see some showers in places, uh, mostly along the coast and into the mountains tonight uh, in the evening hours throughout the night. Some people, not everyone, but some people could certainly see a couple showers passing through the region. Other than that, it's going to be cloudy. These clouds are going to increase, and they're going to stick around for a couple of days. It's not going to be quite as sunny as it has been. Uh, the overnight low for tonight is 61 degrees. So taking a look across the county for tonight, Borrego Springs nice and comfortable at 66 degrees, Mount Laguna 49. As we get further to the coast, it's a bit cloudier, of course, Oceanside 60 degrees, and also a few clouds further inland, Ramona 52 degrees for tonight. Well, here it is for our Thursday. We do have some cooler air coming in off the Pacific. That's cooling things down quite a bit all across most of California. For us, we are going to see some windy conditions especially in the passes in the mountains and also into the deserts. So if you're traveling through those highways, just keep that in the back of your mind. Could feel a couple gusts. So Borrego Springs tomorrow is going to be gorgeous. 95 degrees with lots of sunshine. Mount Laguna, very comfortable, 64 degrees. Cloudier along the coast, Oceanside, 70 degrees. And San Diego, a nice, comfortable 68 degrees. Taking a look at the five-day, well, we see here along the coast, it's going to get a bit cooler on Friday, 60 degrees. We could see some mist in those morning hours. And then on Saturday, it dries out, turns very sunny. Temperatures in the low 70s in your Memorial Day should be nice and clear.
Inland, a similar story. Some mist in the morning on Friday. Temperatures are on the rise by Monday for Memorial Day. We are at 81 degrees. If you have outdoor plans in the mountains for this Memorial Day weekend, sounds like a beautiful weekend to me. Mostly sunny conditions. Temperatures in the mid 60s on Saturday and warming up to the 70s for your Memorial Day. And in the deserts, it's going to be a bit warm. 94 degrees on Saturday and jumping up to 104 on Monday. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Demands for California pollution permits rebounded in the first quarterly auction since an appeals court upheld the program. Today, the California Air Resource Board says it sold out of permits to release greenhouse gases during 2017. The demand exceeded the total supply, pushing prices above the minimum. Nearly 22 percent of permits for future emissions were sold. California's cap and trade program is a key source of funding for a high speed rail project and anti climate change efforts. San Diego scientists are out with a new study tracing the spread of Zika into the U.S. The thing is, their study is actually not all that new. They've known pretty much everything in the paper for months, and they made their findings public long before this week's publication. KPBS science reporter David Wagner says their approach is part of a new trend towards making science more open. All of these little white dots here. Nathan Grubaugh is standing in front of a sequencing machine at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. So this is where all the magic happens. For a paper coming out this week in the journal Nature, he and his colleagues used machines like this to decode dozens of Zika virus genomes. Their samples came from Florida, where Zika began showing up in mosquitoes and humans last year. The virus has been linked with birth defects in countries like Brazil. The team's goal was to find out when, how, and why this virus first came to the U.S. And they knew these genomes could reveal a lot. So we can track which each little piece of DNA, where that came from. Grubaugh opens his laptop and pulls up a file full of sequencing data. It looks like a big Excel spreadsheet, overflowing with A's, C's, G's, and T's. He points to one highlighted column. That some of the viruses have a G there and some of them have an A. Those small genetic differences tell an important story. They're mutations that actually show how the Zika virus changed over time as it spread to new locations. I could quickly tell if it came from Florida or some other place. Grubaugh is the first author on the Nature Study, which shows that Zika mostly came to Florida not from South America, but from the Caribbean. He and his co-authors conclude that Zika came to Florida at least four separate times, likely through busy travel routes connecting Miami with popular Caribbean destinations. It could be like Bahamas or U.S. Virgin Islands and such because it, it makes sense. There's a lot of people that go there to vacation and come back or, or Jamaica or Puerto Rico where you have a lot of family members. These findings are just now coming out in a scientific journal, but a very similar version of this study has actually been publicly available for months. The day the researchers submitted their study to journals, they also posted it to a website called BioArchive. And this was posted on February 3rd, um, now months before it actually will hit mainstream press. And Grubaugh says long before that, they were posting their raw data online in close to real time. We can go from sample to having data online in five to seven days. Grubaugh is just one of the many scientists now choosing to get their research out in the open long before it's formally peer reviewed and published in a journal. They say this approach can make science more transparent and nimble, given that publishing in a journal can take months. And because other researchers can comment on their early findings, they say it can actually enhance peer review. Back in a quiet office, I asked Grubaugh why he and his colleagues decided against the more traditional approach of closely guarding their findings until publication. There's an epidemic happening, and it's, it's wrong in a way to withhold information from the rest of the world that could be beneficial to helping to slow down to prevent Zika virus infections or for other researchers to use what you find to apply to their own work. Grubaugh is a postdoc in Christian Anderson's lab at Scripps. Their lab website has a section where they post their data. It's labeled secrets. So it's just a, a joke that we just make all of our secrets publicly available. But the joke gets at a serious point. In some ways, scientists have an incentive to keep secrets. They can make their careers by publishing big new findings in a top journal. Some might worry that if they share their data too widely, competing scientists might use it to scoop them. Grubaugh says that's an old school mindset, and his team's experience shows that just the opposite can be true. 
By posting on sites like Twitter, GitHub, and NextStrain.org, they were able to make helpful connections with other researchers. Instead of competing, we decided, let's combine our data sets together. And, um, and then you see people that know how to analyze our data in different ways, or have other sorts of data, like the travel data and the mosquito abundance data, and said, hey, we have this stuff too. Maybe this could help your story. One thing most scientists still avoid before publishing in a journal is talking with the media. Which is why you end up with stories like this one, talking about new studies that are technically not that new. In fact, there's a chance that the next big new study you hear about is already online now, if you know where to look. David Wagner, KPBS News. I feel the need, the need for speed. The iconic line that brings back memories. Top Gun star Tom Cruise has confirmed r rumors of a sequel. Now people want to know if it will be filmed here. The 1986 original was a postcard to San Diego with scenes at the Point Loma Lighthouse, Gas Lamp District, and around the county. While San Diego's film office has not been contacted, they say they're excited about the news. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.